Hello, everybody. This is Attorney Augustus Corbett, and I have with me my daughter, Attorney Chloe Corbett, and we got some really important stuff to talk to you about tonight. I have been telling you uh, for the past couple of days that we wanted to do a Facebook Live event. Hello, via... everybody. And we... Uh-oh. Let's see here. Um, I hope everybody's hearing me okay. Hope everybody's hearing me okay here. All right, I need to get some confirmation before we go any further. If we're being heard, okay. Yes, okay. please let us know. But go ahead, Chloe, and, and greet everybody. Let's assume that they hear us okay. Hi, people. It's Chloe Corbett. I am. Um, I'm glad that you are listening to our new. Uh, the new episode of our uh, Defiant Lawyers podcast today, and I'm ready to get talk to talk about these topics. They're very important. All right, very good. I got confirmation that we are being heard fine. Um, and as I was saying, we have, uh, I've been telling you for the past couple of days that we want to talk about a couple of things. A lot is happening uh, in the legal world. Legal news is just, just um, all over the place. And we like to come and try to break the law down and make it as simple as possible for everybody to understand. Um, your legal rights are very, very, very important to you. And you need to know when those rights have been violated. You need to know what to do when those rights have been violated. And so we try to, you know, inform you and um, give you insight on these things. Um, so we got a few topics that we're going to get to um, today. Uh, before we, the main topic is uh, we're, want, we're going to talk to you about how police officers have been able to kill African-American people disproportionately and get away with it for the most part. Okay, so we're going to get into that today. Uh, but before we do, we got a few updates on some of the other cases that we have covered. Things are happening so fast, Chloe, that before we can really get through with one case, here's something else crazy happening. Yes, um, since the last episode and the last time we talked about the Ahmaud Arbery case and the Breonna Taylor case, there have been two, three, four, five, six updates um, on each of those cases and we're learning new things every single day. So I'm excited to update our listeners and viewers and discuss some of those updates on each of those cases. Well, please go ahead and let's, uh, let's get started. So the first update we wanted to talk about was in relation to Ahmad Arbery. Now we have talked about the execution and killing of Ahmad um, very extensively on this podcast. Uh, the last three episodes, uh, we have given in-depth legal analysis on some of the defenses that the McMichaels were trying and will be attempting to use now that they're, they've been arrested um, and charged by the police so far. Uh, one of the major things and major updates on that case is that there has been a third arrest. Um, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation um, did put out a news a press release that they were looking to investigate the cameraman, the person who filmed uh, Mr. Arbery's death and subsequently since releasing that press release uh, they have he has been charged and he has been charged with felony murder um, I've heard a lot of honestly differing opinions about whether or not he should be charged but I fall into the camp of um, Mr. Lee Merritt and Amari Arbery's family that he was a participant. It sounds like he participated, or at least he knew uh, that this killing was going to happen and it was being filmed for that reason. So I fall into the camp that he should be charged and a felony murder seems to be appro the appropriate charge for now. All right, very good. Um, we um, now will move to the second case, the Breonna Taylor case, and just to a really quick but exciting update for that case. And if you would, Chloe, please go ahead. So the last time we talked about, about Brianna Taylor, uh, we told you all 
that her boyfriend had been charged with attempted murder um, of the police officers who came in and, and killed um, uh, Brianna. And he had been arrested and he had been in jail since, since it occurred the, over the past couple of months. And we had speculated and analyzed that he should be released, that the district attorney should withdraw those charges and that indictment, and they have. So I am so excited and happy to hear that uh, the district attorney did come out and say that um, all of the evidence they had had not been pre presented to the grand jury before the grand jury indicted Mr. Walker. Um, they did, though, I will say this, Daddy, they, he did, the new district attorney did leave some wiggle room uh, yeah. for potentially recharging Mr. Walker. So we hope that doesn't happen. Yes. I doubt seriously that it will, um, based on the facts that we know. It may, but I, I just don't think the DA would have done that if he didn't have, you know, good reason to dismiss those charges. He was getting incredible pressure from the uh, police union. Um, I read where they were saying, you know, that how can you possibly release a man who attempted to murder uh, police officers? But despite that pressure, the DA dismissed the charges, did leave himself some wiggle room, but I doubt very seriously that he bring those. I could be wrong, but I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think so. So let's hope not. But yeah. yeah, we think the right thing was definitely done um, given the facts of the Breonna Taylor case, which were very quickly, Chloe, the um, officers just bust into their uh, home while they were asleep uh, in plain clothes, driving a plain car, and started blasting, according to the lawsuit. We went through the lawsuit detail by detail by detail, and from what we understand, that's what happened. And um, as a result, Mr. Walker returned fire, as would anyone who was armed. So we're just glad that he got out and hopefully he'll stay out. I agree. Um, I'm sure there's going to be a bunch of new updates on each of those cases too. So we'll keep you all updated as, as we become aware of them also. All right. So we'll move to, I think, one of the saddest cases that I have heard um, and seen. And, I mean, it's not like the other cases aren't sad. I mean, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, these recent cases, past cases. But for some reason, this just really breaks my heart. And it may be because I see this man's face in the cement like this, with this officer's knee in his neck. And like Eric Garner, he's telling them, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. And on one occasion, uh, he called for his mother. Um, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. And he was very polite. On one, uh, one of those times, he said, I can't, I can't breathe, officer. I can't breathe. So for some reason, this really gets me. And what I want to do, Chloe, we have, um, you know, we have seen the video, but I want to show it again because I don't want us to lose sight of what happened to this man here. Um, we won't show all of it, but we do need to show some of it. Let me get it all queued up. I thought I had it queued up. Some of you all are like, I don't want to see it again. And I get it. While this ad is playing, let me go back um, uh, to you, Chloe, and just tell me what are your initial feelings having seen this video? I'm honestly still processing my emotions. Um, I watched the video again last night and it was hard to sleep after it. I, it, was, it, it was just gut-wrenching um, to hear his pleas um, for his life and to know that he spent the last few moments of his life with this officer literally on his neck um, as his life force 
um, drains out of him is just heartbreaking to think about. And when the video starts, I mean, just hearing this grown man pleading, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. And towards the end, one of the last things and one of the last people he called out for was his mother. So uh, I, uh, words just do not describe um, how heartbreaking it is and how angering it is. And as I was looking at the video and as Mr. Floyd continued to plead and cry out, I can't breathe. It seems like the officer got some type of perverse pleasure out of it. I mean, he, as Mr. Floyd was saying, I can't breathe. He kept his knee on his neck and had this, this look on his face that, I mean, that was just indescribable. Yeah. So that was yeah. something that I noticed. Uh, and I feel like that's a metaphor for what this country and, and white America has done to our people since we were brought here as chattel property from Africa. Well, Chloe, what I'm showing now is an additional video that has been released, and it shows the officers approaching a car that Mr. Uh, Floyd is sitting in. And this is critical key evidence here because, as I understand it, the officers in their sworn, quote, sworn police report alleged that Mr. Floyd had resisted arrest. So we're looking at now a video that was released, I think, by one of the supermarkets or one of the stores uh, nearby. And there doesn't show any resisting arrest whatsoever by Mr. Floyd. Um, so unless there's some more evidence out there, this is another incident of police officers doing what police officers will typically do, and that is lie in their sworn affidavits. And I don't say that, Chloe, I don't say that uh, in a mean spirit way about police officers. I say that because after practicing law for more than a decade, I have caught police officers in lies in their sworn affidavits, okay? In fact, I remember when uh, I was in law school, one of my law professors um, said something that really shocked me in, in our criminal procedure class. He told us, the room was filled with a bunch of law students. He said, there's something that you all are going to find out in your practice. And, you know, what was that? He said that police officers are some of the most dishonest people that you're going to encounter as lawyers. Now that that shocked my conscience because we're taught that police officers are honest, um, good people, that they've been thoroughly vetted, that, you know, they are the cream de la cream of the community. They are oftentimes a city's finest, we, we call them, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, but so many times we find that that is not the case. I've found that to be the case in my law practice. Okay. And so what we've learned now, I'm back to the video there. They've taken Mr. Um, Floyd out of the car. He's not resisting one iota, not one, Chloe. Mm -hmm. uh, they're walking him over to the wall. He gets down on his, uh, he sits down with his hands behind his back. He's not resisting one bit, contrary to the sworn reports that were um, that were um, made by these police officers. And that's the thing, Chloe. Not only did one of those officer, officers uh, say this, but all of them, all of them swore to this, that he resisted arrest. Okay? Not one of them corrected the record. Not one of them said, no, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't resist the rest. They, you know, one lied and the rest covered for him. Okay. That's, that's what that. we see all the time. That's right. That's that thin blue line. Yep. And we know that personally, because last year about the same time we were arrested on 
trumped up charges, uh, a charge of criminal trespassing at this uh, uh, at the Sinopolis Luxury Theater, which we we're going to sue. Um, and the police officers lied on us. They literally just swore in their affidavits to lies. Am, am, am I telling the truth? You're telling the God's honest truth. And we, we saw with, that, with our personal case, and like you said, we see it almost every day or any time that we take on a new um, criminal defense case. So this is something that is not new whatsoever. It's just great in this case that we have surveillance camera and video from bystanders as well to back up um, what we say. Yeah, now, Chloe, the video now shows uh, several officers um, uh, picking him up and walking him over to the police car. And trust me, I don't know if you can see it, but he is not resisting one iota, not mm -hmm. one bit. He's not doing anything but complying with everything that they're telling him. It does look like he's trying to probably tell uh, them that he's hurt or something, but he does not resist them at all. I don't know where that came from, okay? But at some point, now I'm going to play the other video. At some point, for whatever reason, this happens. Well, hold on. This is, I think, the all of the um, protesting that went on. Um, this, this really has riled up the city of Minneapolis and the country. Yes. Um, I'm sorry, I had the wrong video there. And maybe we'll come back to it. Here it is. I got it now. Because I do, I do want to keep this out there. Okay, uh, an ad is playing right now, so... We will just wait. It's important for people to, to watch the video, to see the realities of what is actually going on um, and let it be a shock to their system. Um, sometimes things that we don't wanna see are good for us to give us a, a good kick to get involved, um, to be involved in activism. So I think that everyone should watch this video. All right, it's playing now. And he's saying, please, I can't breathe. Um, one officer has his knee in his neck. Another officer is standing over both of them, looking at it, providing cover. And then there's a second officer who's also holding Mr. Floyd down. So all three of them hear him begging for his life. All three of them. They Actually hear hurt. Go ahead. I actually heard there was a fourth officer who was holding him down as well. So there was three officers, one on his neck, two holding his legs, and then one the officer standing, apart. giving cover. Yeah, there was an yep. Asian officer who was sort of keeping the crowd back. And right. now it shows vividly this officer with his knee. And he looks like you said earlier, you said it very well. It's like there's this perverse look in his face, this officer who has his, I mean, he's just as comfortable. It's like he's just playing golf or something, okay? Mm -hmm. I mean, just just doing what he does. A man is, is basically dying because he's cutting off his circulation, but this officer is not concerned at all. Uh, the Asian officer who's giving cover is not concerned at all. And meanwhile, this poor, pitiful man. This takes me back, Chloe, to Jim Crow. Yep. Okay? That's what this takes me back to. Jim Crow. And if you can, people who've watched the video and heard the audio on the tape, the Asian officer giving cover, you know, protesters are saying, he can't breathe, he can't breathe, give him CPR. And the Asian officer says, well, he shouldn't have been doing drugs. Wow. As, wow. as Mr. Floyd's life is literally being drawn out of his body. Wow. This is a human being here with, who's made in the image of God. Yep. 
Where do they get such contempt? Where is this coming from? Well, that's something that I'll talk about tonight when I continue my series, why the white church is the biggest purveyor of racism in America. That's tonight, about 7.30. Um, I hate to keep showing this video, but we need to see the face of evil or the faces of evil, okay? And someone has been circulating a picture of this police officer or allegedly this police officer wearing a make uh, whites great again hat. Now, I don't know if that it's, is true, a true depiction, I'm not sure, um, but it is circulating around and it would not surprise me that this officer was in fact that person, okay? So, so we just played the video again. It is horrendous to look at. Sorry, you even had to play it again, but like you said, folks need to see it. So now let's talk about why all four of these police officers very well may face no charges and why these police officers may get their jobs back or get a job somewhere else why they will probably be getting paid or, or will uh, be getting some sort of financial assistance from the police union, um, why they probably will not suffer any sort of civil remedies or damages. So let's talk about that now because that's what folks want to know. How is it that police officers can get away with this? How does the law permit this to happen? How can they do this legally? Well, we're getting ready to get into it. And let's start looking, first of all, at the criminal side of things. Okay? Now, you can, you can take one of these cases. I can take them. How do you want to do this? Let me, let me kick it off with, with, with um, let, me, let me say this. One of the biggest reasons why police officers are able to do this is because of Supreme Court cases. There have been some Supreme Court cases that have come down over the years, over the last 30 years or so, 40 years, that have given police officers incredible, incredible power and authority in the streets. I mean, in Incredible. And with that incredible power, they are oftentimes able to kill with impunity. And all the more so if who they kill is a black man. Now, I'm talking about a couple of cases. One, um, I did a video on this some years ago. It is a case that was handed down in the mid 80s. The name of the case, Chloe, is Tennessee versus Garner. And very briefly, the facts of the case are um, um, a woman heard someone, heard a disturbance in a house that was next to hers at about 10, 45, 11 o'clock at night. She called the police. It was well lit up so the police could see uh, what was going on. And Mr. Garner was uh, at the base of a fence and um, the officer cried, halt, you know, stop, police. And meanwhile, Mr. Garner uh, attempted to uh, jump over the fence. Now, the officer had his flashlight, so he saw the face of Mr. Garner and he saw Mr. Garner's hands. But when Mr. Garner got over that fence, the police officer shot him in the back of the head, okay? In the back of the head, killing him immediately, all right? Um, Mr. Garner's back was to the police officer. He had nothing in his hands. He was posing no threat to the police officers or to any bystander. Yet the police officer shot him in the back of the head, in the back of the head, killing him. This case made it all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court. And I want to 
read for the folks what the holding was in this case, Chloe. Okay. Okay. The U.S. Supreme Court held that such force may not be used, may not be used unless it is necessary to prevent the escape and the officer has probable cause to believe that the suspect poses a significant threat or death or serious physical injury to the others or uh, to the officer. Now that's what the case is, and let's, let's see what that means. So essentially, this says if, 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 if a police officer is trying to apprehend a, what we call in the law, a fleeing felon, okay? And if the police officer shoots that fleeing felon, or it may not be committing to fleeing, just in the one trying to get away from what appears to be a crime that has been committed, the police officer cannot shoot that person unless that person, uh, based on probable cause, poses a significant threat of death or significant physical injury to the police officer or to someone else. So if the man, if the person is empty handed, if they, you remember the Walter Scott case, he was running from the police and got shot in the back? Mm -hmm. In South Carolina, I think it was Charleston. That's prime example. That's why that police officer eventually pled guilty to murder because Mr. Scott was posing no danger to anyone. He didn't have a gun. He didn't have a knife. He didn't have a brick. None of that. No one was close to him. He wasn't posing a threat to the police officer. So pursuant to Tennessee versus Garner, that was not uh, uh, um, he, they should not have, have shot Mr. Scott pursuant to Tennessee v. Garner. Now, Chloe, if you change the facts a little bit, okay, if you change the facts a little bit, that will give police officers the authority to shoot somebody who's running away. Let's say that the person is running away with a gun or they think there's a gun. They got probable cause to believe there's a gun. And Chloe, we know that probable cause doesn't require a lot of evidence. Right. It's a really, really low standard. So an officer can just say, oh, it appeared that he had a gun or it appeared that some type of crime was being committed. That's right. Which is why we followed the suspect. Exactly. And so how many cases have we seen of police officers pursuing someone and shoot them in the back and then claim we saw a gun? Okay. Um, there was, uh, there were police officers in Baltimore who were found to have planted guns on people. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, but bottom line is if someone is running and, and they, there's no evidence that they have a gun, no evidence that, uh, they are a threat to anyone, to the officer or to somebody else. The police officer pursuant to Tennessee versus Garner cannot or should not shoot that person. And that should be the end of story. But that's not end of story because there was a case that came out about four years later that tweaked the holding in Tennessee versus Garner. OK, so let's talk about that case now, Chloe. Go ahead. Well, before we go into that case, I want to say that the Tennessee v. Garner case also left a lot of leeway for um, officers. Um, if you look at the holding, it's the Supreme Court said that we conclude that such force may not be used unless it is necessary to prevent the escape. Right. So we already know that the officer, a, a lot of officers, you know, use the justification, oh, he had a gun or, oh, he was committing some crime. Um Coupled with that, with those in most times their lives, um, they'll use the, the, the language from here that we were trying to prevent um, the suspect's escape. So that holding was broad enough to leave a lot of leeway um, for officers. They are actually charged 
arrested and charged uh, with, you know, excessive force cases or have a criminal charge against them for, for killing a suspect, um, for them to say, well, not only did he have the gun and, you know, he posed a significant threat of death or serious bodily injury to myself or others, but we had to stop him from escaping too. That's right. And, and, and I think that's a beautiful segue into um, the next case that was handed down like four years later, uh, Graham versus Connor. And um, I, I, I'm going to get right to the holding in that case, Chloe. Yeah. Um, basically, there's language in that case that, do, do, that, that does give police officers the authority to shoot people, okay, and to get away with it, all right? For example, there is language in this Graham versus Connor case that says that um, the Fourth Amendment reasonableness inquiry is whether the officers, watch this, whether the officers' actions are objectively, objectively reasonable in light of the facts and circumstances confronting them without regard to their underlying intent or motivation. Now, we got to break that down. Yeah. I mean, we got to back up on that. So these cases are uh, analyzed under the Fourth Amendment, okay? And they're analyzed under what's called a reasonableness, reasonableness inquiry. And that inquiry acts basically whether the officer's actions are objective, ob objectively, I don't know why I'm having a hard time talking, <laughs> uh, <laughs> objectively uh, reasonable in light of the facts and circumstances confronting them. And we'll leave that last little part for, for, uh, for, for later here because it's going to really blow your mind when, you, when we talk about it. But... Basically, what this all means is um, when we look at police shootings or when, when juries look at police shootings or when um, whomever looks at police shootings, they really got to give the officer the benefit of the doubt, yeah. basically, okay, to put it in layman's terms. Whether the officer, whether the shooting was reasonable depends on what the facts and circumstances were that were confronting the officer. Okay, Chloe? Yeah, and we know oftentimes the facts and circumstances um, don't usually come out because, like we said earlier, the officers lie in their affidavits. That's if right. there's no video like there was in George Floyd's case, then there's really a, a question of whose word will the jury believe, an officer or... Um, uh, bystanders or other witnesses. That's right. And then it goes on to say, it doesn't matter. This is the part that should really make the hair in the back of your head stand up. Goes on to say, it doesn't matter what the officer's underlying intent or motivation was. So if they were actually intending to do some harm or their motivation was bad for the shooting, it doesn't matter. What matters are the facts and circumstances that were confronting the officer. And like, like you just said, Chloe, those facts and circumstances are pretty much going to be what the officers say because there's probably going to be a dead blight guy who can't speak for himself. Wow. Wow. It's, and this is sanctioned. This is, this is law from the, the United States Supreme Court. That's that right. makes it law in all 50 states as well as federal um, criminal cases. That's exactly right. Okay, let's go to the next one. The reasonableness of a particular use of force must be judged from the perspective of a reasonable officer on the scene. So here's what that means. You put the case in front of a jury, okay? Put the case in front of a jury and the prosecutor, uh, pardon me, the defense lawyer is going to, and I'm going to come back, we need to come back to the prosecutor because they are the ones who present these cases to grand juries, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the defense lawyers for the, for the police officer is going to be in the ear of the jury, 
saying, forget what your perspective is, forget what you think that officer should have done. You got to judge this officer based on the perspective of what a reasonable office would have done on the scene. And then what they'll do, Chloe, is get an expert, mm -hmm. a so-called expert, police uh, uh, um, use of force expert to come and really just make it look like there was nothing this officer could have done different. Uh, things were just so hectic, uh, which goes into the next thing. Uh, this case is its calculus must embody an allowance for the fact that police officers are often forced to make split second, split second decisions about the amount of force necessary in a particular situation. So once again, uh, the jury is going to hear from the defense lawyer and especially from the expert that this officer did what, what this officer had to do. This officer was making split uh, second decisions. This officer didn't have time to sit back and think about this. This officer didn't have the benefit of hindsight. So you all sitting in the box today, you 12 folks in the jury, uh, be careful second guessing a police officer out there protecting you uh, from uh, criminals like this uh, because you, you know if you in that situation, you don't know what you were gonna do either. So give this officer the benefit of the doubt. You follow me? Yep. That's what happens. Okay. And these and cases. Go ahead. These cases show that until a, a, a case goes before the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court changes um, the way it views the reasonable, the reasonableness um, and reasonable inquiry standard that it applies to police officers in their criminal prosecutions of um, deadly force cases, not much will change. That's right. So, it's, yeah. No, go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt you. So, so when people ask us, why is it that, you know, officers are not being criminally prosecuted? Why are charges almost never brought? Or if charges are brought, um, why, if it goes to trial, do are they found not guilty? It's because of, of cases like this. Right. And if you read a lot of the police organizations and, and police association forums and literature that they put out, they really laud the fact and applaud the fact that the Supreme Court um, protects their interests. Because, it, they, it, I mean, it's clear, <laughs> even to the police associations themselves, just how um, skewed in favor of police officers um, the Supreme Court really is. Yes, so that's why in most of their reports in these kinds of shootings, uh, it's pretty much sort of boilerplate uh, for them to, uh, to say, I thought he had a gun, he reached in his pocket, um, uh, he made a, um, a, a furtive move, um, he did something that, you know, just made me think that and, and, and we've seen them sometimes get on the stand and cry, you know, I thought he was getting ready to shoot me, you know, or I thought he was getting ready to run over my partner or something. Um, and that's not to take away from the fact that police officers do have a dangerous job to do. But these cases are being used to kill a whole lot of innocent people, oftentimes black people, because of the language that the court has left in these cases and these police training academies, they teach these officers what these cases say. Mm -hmm. And so these officers know pretty much if they shoot somebody, they got a lot of protection based on these cases. All right. And a lot of these cases, Chloe, charges are not even filed because when the charge, when the uh, investigative file is given over to the prosecutor, you were a prosecutor. Um, when, when, the, when, the, when the investigative file is given over to the prosecutor, the prosecutor will stop it right there because, you know, either they are pro-law enforcement or they know what the U.S. Supreme Court has said in these cases. And their attitude is we're not we don't I mean, we're not going to prosecute this. I mean, this is 
it was reasonable for him to think that the guy had a, had a gun. Uh, it was 12 o'clock at night. This guy was, had a record. He was a felon. He had on a hoodie. Uh, he was big and black. Um, he had a bulge in his pocket. Um, whatever. Yeah. You see? Mm -hmm. And then even if the officer think that it thinks, uh, the, if the DA thinks that it should go to uh, the grand jury, they're going to present it to the grand jury in such a way to help the officer. And what people don't understand about grand juries, oftentimes the state, uh, uh, pardon me, the defense lawyer for the, for the, uh, or the plaintiff lawyer or whoever's representing the family for the dead man is not able to go inside the grand jury when the prosecutor is presenting the case. Okay? Sometimes in some jurisdictions, Chloe, we have been able to present a grand jury packet and we can request to come in and, and talk to the grand jury, but we don't have a right to be there. It is up to the prosecutor to agree um, to it. And, uh, but when they're in there talking to the grand jury, they're saying stuff uh, to, to, to kind of lead the grand jury in the direction that they want them to go. Right. And that's why, just like you outlined, that's why so many cases are not um, presented to the grand jury because the law, the Supreme Court um, rulings have sanctioned, okay, even if we do charge this officer, it's more likely than not if it's pre presented to a jury and that officer has a criminal defense attorney who is worth his or her salt, is going to um, play up on these factors and uh, present the law in such a way where the jury, um, will likely find the, the officer not guilty. So at the end of the day, it all goes down to the rulings from the, the United States Supreme Court. Yes, and state courts, as you indicated earlier, tend to pick up on what the US Supreme Court says because it, they have to. I mean, if the Supreme Court rule a certain way, everybody like you said, across the country is bound by that ruling. And so in Texas, for example, there's a case, Trammell versus Fruge, um, 868 F3rd 332, page 340. Uh, there's language there that says that uh, there should be a careful attention to the facts and circumstances of each particular case, which means give the officer the benefit of the doubt. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Whatever the officer says should be essentially believed unless there's a video. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So keep your phones with you and don't be uh, afraid to pull them out and start recording. Now do it safely. Don't do it in a way that makes the, gives the officer a reason to shoot you. Okay. Do it safely. But I'm telling you, uh, cell phones have been a game changer. They really have. I mean, we saw that with Ahmad Arbery. Uh, we see, hopefully we'll see that with George Floyd. Um, those officers have been fired. We're waiting to see whether they're going to have criminal charges brought against them or a civil suit brought against them by Mr. Floyd's family. Um, but keep, stay armed with your, with your cell phone, because that can often be the difference between whether or not um, a, an officer is held accountable. Yes. Yeah, so I, 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 I want to tie this together before we move on. I want to tie together the fact that we told you about Tennessee versus Garner, where we said a police officer cannot or should not shoot someone in the back who's running away, trying to get away, and they pose no significant threat to anybody, including the officer. But we're saying that four years later, uh, the U.S. Supreme Court came back and gave a bunch of nuances mm. that would now basically make it okay to shoot somebody who's running away as long as the facts and circumstances, according to the police officer, uh, uh, you know, justify the shooting. So if there's an unarmed 
person running away and it's dark at night. It's just the police officers and the dead man. There are no videos. They can say any number of things and they do say any number of things. Okay. So that's pretty much undermines the Tennessee versus Garner case. Yeah. And these, these rulings give a, a safety shield to the officers. Uh, when these shootings happen, you often see, at least I often see, kind of a cockiness from the officers because they're taught this in police academies. Right. They read these on they read these cases and these protections on their police association forums and Facebook groups. Um, right. So they feel emboldened. Okay, like we discharge our weapon, we use deadly force on someone. More likely than not, we're going to be protected. That's right. So it goes back to the nine people who are sitting um, on that Supreme Court in Washington, D.C. And who determines that? The president and Congress. So we need to get out the vote and make sure that we have justices on the Supreme Court who understand the value of black life, um, who understand um, that the government and the law should not just give broad protections to police officers who unjustly kill our people. So get out the vote, get out the vote. We need people, we need justices on the, on the court um, to make different rulings and interpret these cases differently. I cannot underscore that more. I cannot, I mean, Chloe, that is so very important. Right now you have Donald Trump in office and he has nominated a bunch of extreme right-wing judges. Mm -hmm. They, what, uh, nearly 200 or so of them have been confirmed by the Senate, which is what Mitch McConnell's domain over there. Mm -hmm. And some of these folks are being trained and prepared to take seats the other seats on the U.S. Supreme Court so that they can continue this sort of jurisprudence uh, to protect these kinds of shootings. So, oh, you're so absolutely right. You just can't think about um, who the president's going to be. You got to also think about who's the president going to nominate yep. to sit on the court in some of these, not only Supreme Court, that's the, that's the big cojona, but the uh, the appellate courts, the circuit appellate courts um, around the country, because most of the time, Chloe, as we know, the circuit uh, appellate courts really establish the law mm -hmm. because the U.S. Supreme Court gets very few cases. Mm -hmm. They take very few cases. Mm -hmm. OK, so what the circuit courts say will often be the final word unless the case makes it. What is that? Excuse me. There was a loud noise outside my home. Oh, we're, okay. We're working remotely, guys, so forgive that. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know what that was. <laughs> I didn't either. <laughs> uh, but at any event, yeah, so these appellate courts, the circuit appellate courts, are the ones who determine much of the law across the country because the U.S. Supreme Court only takes 80, 90, 70 cases or less than that. Um, so what you said is so very important. The president, then the Senate are confirming these folks. And a lot of my conservative friends, um, you know, they, they look at the issue of, of abortion and they look at the issue of gay marriage and that is it for them. That's the end of their analysis. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of these folks that Trump has nominated are, uh, or, you know, I, I, a lot of them, I think, are pro-life. They're probably uh, pro-traditional -tra marriage. Um, and, uh, but they also tend to harbor a strong animosity towards civil rights. And they are like hungry wolves, oftentimes, waiting to get their hands on a civil rights case to, to, to gut it. 
or to give the police even more protections to shoot unarmed black men. That's just the facts, okay? So, I, you know, I had to come to the realization that as important as uh, abortion is, and as much as I oppose it, and as much as I believe in traditional marriage, I had to, however, consider other uh, uh, issues that are extremely important for the black community. I just wanted to put this out there, okay, because I know there are a lot of Christians who are, uh, who are probably listening. And abortion, gay marriage, all those are important issues, but they're not the only issues facing black Americans. Okay. Not at all. Not at all. Um, the issue facing us is the devaluing of black life. And that goes in all aspects of areas um, beyond just abortion or the belief in traditional marriage, but actually valuing black life and not having um, courts and judges um, devaluing us. So it's important to be, we like to say, interested and empowered on issues of justice and righteousness for, for those Christ followers. Amen. Very good. Very good. And, 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 and in all honesty, you know, I'm, uh, as your father, much older than you, and you are millennial, you're younger, you probably don't stand as strongly on some of the, you, you know, the, the abortion stuff as I do. Uh, <laughs> you know, we're not, we're not ashamed of saying I'm not a, you know, um, I think that makes our discussion interesting when there are two points of view. Um, you're a committed Christian, you love the Lord, um, all of that, but you probably are, you probably are not as pro-life uh, as I am. Although I think you are, you, you, you tend to be, you tell me, speak for yourself here, where are you at on that? Um, I would, I'm, I'm definitely a lot more progressive than you are. Um, okay. So I do, I am a Christ follower. And I do put the Bible in the highest regard and, and follow it. Um, but I'm not going to make abortion or gay marriage bigger issues than issues of justice. That's just not, that's not where I see it. To me, issues of justice, to me, issues of, of police brutality and not valuing black life, executing and slaughtering us um, are core issues because if, if a person is not allowed to live, um, then to me, the other issues don't come into play. So that's why I respect that. I, mean, I, I love the way you put that. Um, God is a God of righteousness and justice. And these justice issues should get um, as much play and consideration as the righteousness issues. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. And a lot of my conservative friends, in my opinion, are out of balance with respect to those two issues. They heavily lean toward the righteousness, put no focus on the justice issues. And I think that is the result of the influence of white evangelical males, pretty much. Mm -hmm. um, the, there's a group of them out there, preachers, white male preachers, who have gone on the record to say sh social justice is not of God. I mean, these are, these are not what you would consider to be, um, you know, extremist like type Christians in the sense of in, in, um, uh, who are, um, in, um, uh, I'm, I'm, the word is not coming to me right now. So, but these are traditional, that's what I'm trying to say. These are traditional preachers. And they went on the record, signed a document saying that social justice is not of God, that it is basically a violation of the gospel, that um, Jesus did not condone any kind of social justice. And I just don't know what Bible they're reading. Yeah, I'm not with that at all. <laughs> I'm neither, not with that. neither is the Lord. Yeah. I mean, I, it's, I mean, Jesus said he specifically said in Luke chapter four, 
He said, and we're going to get back to the law in just a second, but he specifically said in Luke chapter 4 that the spirit of the Lord is upon me for he has sent me to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to set at liberty those, the, the, the captive. I mean, those are people in prison. Um, to, to heal those who uh, have just had a hard time of life. And, and, and throughout the word of God, we see the Lord putting high premium on the issue of justice. So I don't know what Bible they're reading. Right. I really don't. Okay. So we'll get back to the law. Well, well, I think it's good to bring up that point because um, there are a lot of Christians who um, turn a blind eye to the issues of justice and to when a black person is killed and they're just so solely focused on um, abortion and gay rights. And it's like, no, <laughs> you get, I mean, if you, you call yourself a Christian, but you don't value um, other people's lives, that makes absolutely no sense. So we want to make sure that we talk to those people as well that do not turn a blind eye um, when you see the George Floyds of the world um, being killed or when you see the disproportionate number of black men in prison or the disproportionate number of black boys um, dropping out of school and going to going to jail in prison. Don't turn a blind eye to that. Because that, is, that is so true. Yes. I'm so sorry. We, got, we have to speak to those people as well. That this yes. is not just for black people, minorities. This should be an issue for all people, especially those who who call themselves Christians and Christ followers. And another thing that that crowd tends to also do, Chloe, is to say, well, you know, where's the outrage when a black kills a black? Yeah. When a black guy kills a black guy, where's the outrage? Where's all the, where all the, and, and, and I've felt that at times myself. I still feel like we need to put a good amount of focus on the violence that tends to permeate um, poor African-American communities. I, I'm not at all shy about saying that because we lose a lot of young black men. You and I see, you and I see it every day. We represent some of these guys and we see every day how black on black crime is, is, is taking the lives of a lot of young black men. But here's my point, Chloe. We can say that and still stand against blue on black crime. Exactly. They're not mutually exclusive. And, and I also understand why the outrage is so strong when you see this kind of thing happening. I'm putting back on the screen now the police officer with his knee. This is a police officer. He has a badge. He's an agent of the government. He's sworn to protect. He's the cream de la cream of the, of the, of the, of the community, of the, of the city. His background has been thoroughly vetted. He is um, supposedly someone that we can trust. And he does this. They do this. So, yeah, we don't. And, and again, this thing about him being... Um, this thing about him being the, uh, uh, an agent of the government is very, very, very important. This is government tyranny when we see this. So we need to stand against it, absolutely. And we have a right to stand against it. Amen. <laughs> so, all right, so now we're gonna get back to, um, let's get back to the law here. Um, because the last thing that we want to talk about now is the fact that not only are these police officers not held criminally liable, but they also tend to get away with, with, with this stuff in civil court as well. So like the family of Mr. Floyd is hoping that the officers will be charged with, um, with the crime. They're also hoping that they can prevail in civil court and get money damages against these officers and against the city. Right. Um, so, but we find out, Chloe, that the police officers have protection as well in civil cases. Right. It's called qualified immunity. So 
Um, the Supreme Court and federal courts on down have said that uh, government officials, government agents, including police officers, um, are immune from being sued if um, the officer raises that raises it the immunity and states that there has been no clear clearly established violation of a constitutional right or constitutional or um, federal statute so oftentimes these civil cases excuse me for the noise outside guys i'm sorry if y'all hear that <laughs> <laughs> it's live like you said ain't no biggie it's live <laughs> so oftentimes um when these civil cases are brought the, the officers bring up this defense, qualified immunity. Um, they it's affirmative. It's an affirmative defense. Um, so they bring it up, and the plaintiff usually can not show what clearly established violation has occurred of a federal statute or constitutional right. So the lawsuit is stopped at its tracks. It doesn't That's even right. get to a jury. That's exactly right, and. Uh, they usually stop, get stopped in their tracks at what we call summary judgment motions. Yep. Um, as soon as the case is filed and discovery is done, here comes uh, the defense firm filing a summary judgment motion and asking the judge to basically stop this before it even gets any further, like you just said. And oftentimes, the overwhelming majority of times, this qualified immunity, this official immunity, they both protect police officers and that is the reason why they get away with it that is the reason why they continue to do it because they know nothing will happen to them either in criminal court for the most part and I'm talking about the overwhelming majority of cases mm -hmm. okay I would dare say 99.9% .9 .9 of police shootings especially of young black men or black men, period, they go nowhere in the criminal justice system and they go nowhere in the civil system, okay? Because they have a lot of protection from these cases as well as uh, from, um, uh, from this qualified and official immunity that Chloe just told us about. So there it is, there it is. That's why they continue to do this, they know Nothing is going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, they know when they when they when they are taken off duty, they're going to still be paid. Uh, the police union is going to protect them. Nothing happens, so why why stop doing it? Basically, basically, and keep in mind, guys, that the the cases that we talk about, they get national cases. There's dozens and maybe even hundreds of um, officer-involved shootings of um, black men and women that are never criminally prosecuted, do not get national spotlight attention. Um, if a lawsuit is even filed against a police officer, is usually stopped in its tracks by um, these qualified and official immunity um, defenses. So nothing changes, unfortunately. That is why it is important. And we have to go back to something we've been harping on um, for years, really, and for months with our podcast, you have to get out the vote. The people who are in charge, the people who are in elected uh, positions, really set the tone for what happens in this country, from local elections on up. So we have to get over this notion that your vote means nothing, your vote doesn't matter, I ain't voting, it doesn't change, and yes, it does. That's just false. That's a false narrative. And we have to change that narrative. Well, um, we got a question here. And you all send your questions in if you have any. We're getting ready to, to, to uh, conclude this. But we did uh, get this question. And the question is, is qualified immunity a defense? Is it, it, is it a defense used in all 50 states? And the answer is yes. Yep. Yes, the answer is yes, because it is a um, it's it's federal immunity, and most of the states, all the states, have picked it up. Yeah. Okay. Most of these cases, by the way, are brought in federal court. Okay. Uh, pursuant to um, 
pursuant to what we call a Section 1983 claim. Uh, mm -hmm. It comes from uh, 42 U.S.C. Section 1983 um, under the Civil Rights Act. And it basically says every person who under the color of an, any statute, ordinance, regulation, custom, or usage of any state or territory or the District of Columbia subjects or causes to be subject, subjected, any citizen of the United States or other person within the jurisdiction thereof to the deprivation of any rights, privileges, or immunities secured by the Constitution and laws shall be liable to the party injured in any action at law. Okay? So, long way of saying police officers are subject to this particular statute. However, qualified immunity, as Chloe explained to us, can uh, be a defense to a Section 1983 um, lawsuit, cause of action. Yep. So, if you're wondering why they get away criminally, why they get away in civil court, now you know. This is why. Get out the vote, people. Vote, vote. Voting matters. Your voting counts. I cannot say that enough. Your voting matters. Who we have in office matters. Um, who we have as district attorneys, as police chiefs, as county commissioners, as state and district judges, justices, um, congressmen, <laughs> senators, the president, it all matters. And we need more... Um, People, we need more black people in those positions and we need more people who understand these issues of justice as well. Well, I think you make an excellent point and we can point actually to Dallas County um, that has a whole lot of black judges. The police chief is black. The county sheriff is black. The DA is black. A lot of the judges are black. And as a result of that, a lot of prosecutors are black. Mm -hmm. As a result of that, Chloe, um, unlike most jurisdictions, we have been able to see three police officers held accountable, okay, uh, for killing uh, minorities, two for killing blacks, and I think one for killing a Hispanic guy, okay? That is not coincidental. That is because of the truth and what you said, having black folks at the table in positions of power, um, the truth of what you said re with respect to voting, and not just presidential elections, but local elections. If it's time to vote, you need to be voting. Yep. You need to vote. I don't care, I often say, if it's dog catcher or tree trimmer, you need to be voting in it, okay? You need to make your voice Heard. And before we get out of here, I want to ask you something as a millennial, okay? Mm -hmm. As a millennial, um, P. Diddy, Charlemagne, and I think Ice Cube is now on that bandwagon. They are saying something about hold the vote to get the Democrat Party's attention. Um, to force the Democrat Party to take the black vote more seriously, which I agree with. I agree with making the Democrat Party take our vote more seriously. But I don't know if telling people not to vote, I don't think, I, I know that's not the right way to do this, okay? Our forefathers would turn over in their graves, number one. That's looking back. And number two, if we don't vote, we just laid out for you how that can affect issues of criminal justice, of excessive force cases. If you don't vote and get the right people in these offices and in these courts, the stuff that we're seeing here with George Floyd and others will continue. Now, that's my position. Claude, what is your position on that? I feel like the sentiment behind it is correct. Uh, we do need to be more uh, discerning of who we give our votes to uh, because if, I mean, the Democratic Party relies on our vote, therefore, oftentimes they only give us lip talk about what they're going to do for the Black community and don't actually do anything. 
I don't believe I'm holding the vote is the right way to um, hold the Democratic Party accountable to us. Uh, if Let's start our own party or do something else to achieve the means of uh, making both parties uh, make sure that they're accountable to us and that plans are put in place um, that help the Black community specifically. But not voting and holding the vote, I don't believe is the right way to do it. Absolutely yes. not. Yeah, that's never the right thing to do, ever. I, I remember when Hillary was running a group of preachers, um, including Charles Blake of the uh, Church of God in Christ, uh, presiding bishop. Uh, he and a group of other preachers penned a letter and sent it to Hillary saying, okay, we're going to support you, but here are the things that we want you to do. These are the, if you want our continued support and though in the support of our congregations and our members and our communities and neighborhoods, these are the things that you have got to do. I think that's a better approach, Chloe, than some hold the vote. OK, that's all some black folks need anyway to stay home from the polls is yep. to hear Ice Cube and P. Diddy say don't vote. Yeah, that's that's going to be enough for them to stay home. And that could very well be the reason Donald Trump gets reelected because of that foolishness. OK, that is foolishness to me. We got to vote, not just because of what happened, uh, the fact that we lost Dr. King and other folks trying to get the right to vote, but for the future, we can't stand, I don't see where we can stand as African Americans another four years of Donald Trump in this racist stuff that he brings to the table. We got to get rid of him. And we also need to get folks in the Senate and folks in the House and then on down the line, down ballot, ballot votes, folks in, in the DA's offices around the country, folks in the state legislatures, folks in the governor's office who are responsive and attentive to our issues. Yep. I'm an ABT voter. I'm an anyone but Trump voter. Um, he has to get out of office. So I am going to support anyone who um, opposes Trump. And right now is Joe Biden. He's the presumptive Democratic nominee. So he will have my vote in November. Uh, despite some of the problematic statements he's made, we have to get Trump out of the office. And before we get off, because I know we're about to get off really quick soon, I just want to say that Black people need to stop shaming Black prosecutors. We need Black prosecutors um, at the table um, in the district attorney's offices so that they can bring different perspectives um, to law enforcement and to these prosecutorial offices. So we saw with Kamala Harris and some other prominent black prosecutors and black, and black district attorneys, um, them being shamed. I mean, that's just foolishness to me. That's, that's ignorance. We need different perspectives and diverse opinions in the district attorney's office so that when your defense attorney goes in and speaks to that black prosecutors like look this is the factors that led up to um, our client being in this situation can you understand this can you do something else can you defer prosecution can you do other alternatives um so i think we need to stop with the shaming of of, of black prosecutors and some people do need to be prosecuted i mean there's but there's bad people in every race so I just wanted to get that out there. <laughs> Let's keep Very it good. <laughs> Very good. Uh, excellent. Uh, you haven't been a prosecutor. Um, I, I completely agree with you. One thousand and five hundred and ninety nine. I mean, just to the roof, because now I've never been a prosecutor and, and I'm happy to say I've never been a prosecutor. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, it is just what you said is so critically important. We need more black folks in the prosecutor's office and in the police department and in the sheriff's department and all over the place. You know, even, uh, you know, even shaming black police officers. Uh, we need more black police officers, okay? Yeah. We just need them to stand up yeah. when their white colleagues are doing foolishness, 
Okay, we've seen uh, with our incident, there were a couple of uh, uh, a couple of black police officers that we thought would just come and just get things straightened out for us. Man, they did exactly what the white guys were were telling them to do. Yep. So we need we do need folks in these offices and these positions, but we need them to have backbone. We need them to have um, you know a propensity for justice and to be able to stand up to their white colleagues. Would you agree with that, Chloe? I would agree. Stand up, stand up, <laughs> <laughs> stand up. <laughs> and, and as we come to a close, um, I do want to go back to Joe Biden a minute. I, I looked at Joe Biden's 22 page, um, lift every voice, um, black agenda. Mm -hmm. And I compared it in two different videos to what Donald Trump is offering. Donald Trump has no agenda, is my conclusion. Joe Biden has laid out a very detailed agenda. So I don't understand what Charlemagne and P. Diddy and the rest of them are saying about not having a black agenda. Glo uh, uh, Joe does have one, okay? Now he, he, he needs to do even more there's always more you can do to help the black community get from, from where it is. But he, someone has put some serious thought into issues that affect our community and, 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 and wonderful. Now, I heard a report about Joe's campaign that basically said the folks who are at the very highest echelon of his campaign are average age 62 and they are all white. Mm -hmm. OK, now, though, that needs to change because those are the people that are really advising Joe and who are making the decisions for his campaign. OK, and the rest of the all the black folks who are underneath them are just told what to do. Y'all just go make this happen. It is the folks who are around him and at the highest echelon who are all white and old. OK, he needs to stop that. And yeah. now, do you think that he should have a black female running mate? I do. Because okay. I feel like black women put him in as the presumptive Democratic nominee. And especially in South Carolina, um, especially after um, Congressman Clyburn came out in support of um, Joe Biden. Um, black women really came to town for him. And he, I believe he owes us. Now, I saw an interview that Joe Clyburn did with the View, ABC. Jim, the Jim View. Clyburn. Excuse me, Jim Clyburn, yeah. And I'm glad you're bringing that up, okay? I'm glad you're bringing <laughs> up that interview because I was going to bring it up. Yes. Yeah, so <laughs> one of the anchors, Sonny Hostin, who's a former prosecutor and lawyer, um, she has the same position as me. She She basically said that she believes that Joe Biden should um choose a black female vice president and jim clyburn he bucked at that and he said i don't believe anyone should be telling him what he must do and he really rebuked her uh i think that's old school thinking i think that's why a lot of black millennials are not with joe biden and with the jim clyburn out crowd uh, i think that's why a lot of um the charlemagne's out there and other rappers and other millennials I feel like the Democratic Party are uh, taking advantage of our vote and they're using black people kind of as Uncle Tom's. <laughs> Their words, not mine. Wow. Uh, yeah, I, I, I saw some people call Mr. Clyburn that. So there's a disconnect between people, your generation and people my generation that as to how best to go forward to make sure that our vo voices are heard and that people in leadership make sure that we're taken care of. No, you're absolutely right. Um, Jim Clyburn is someone that I hold in the highest regards. He is um, a, a well-respected uh, congressman. He has leadership position in Nancy Pelosi's, um, um, you know, cabinet uh, or you know the people around her. Um, but there are a couple of things that I strongly disagree with Jim Clyburn about, one of which is what you just said. I think, I personally think he should have a black female running mate, period. And I think that it would be a big mistake if he doesn't. 
because um, black people make up 20% of the Democrat Party. And most of that 20% are females, black women. And if you don't believe black women have a considerable amount of power in the Democrat Party, come here to Dallas, Texas. <laughs> and, and you will see <laughs> that nearly anything a black woman runs for here, she wins. Okay? Yeah. Because most of the Democrats here are black women. All yeah. right? And that's pretty much true across the country. But that's not the only reason I want to see a black female pre vice president. I love my sisters. Um, and I think that the black female perspective is long overdue and should be, I mean, you've, you know, you all have, have, have been so strong and so powerful, um, in the black experience and the American experience. And now for that reason, Chloe, more than even seeing a black woman vice president, and this is one of the things I held against Obama, I would, I would even more so love to see a black woman on the U.S. Supreme Court. Yeah, me too. Okay? Um, I mean, you got everybody else up there, not one black female. I don't get that. I don't understand why Obama didn't do that. He was able to put, I think, three people on the court? Yeah. Was it three? Sotomayor. Kagan. Kagan. And he, well, he nominated well, Mary. Well, he nominated, that's right. He tried to get three. He only got two. Yeah. One of those should have been a black woman. I agree. Period. Point blank. Hands down. Should have been a black woman. Okay. And so I, I'm, I stand strongly for that, for putting a, woman, a black woman on the court. And that may be what Joe ends up doing kind of splitting the baby, okay? Um, I'm a, I'm a, he may end up saying, I'm going to put a, a white female, I'm going to have a white female running mate so that I can bring in more white votes. Um, but, black people, I am going to give you a black, supreme, a black female Supreme Court justice. I don't know, but that may be what he ends up doing. I don't it know. It, it, that kind of sounds like a cop-out. Because he can say, well, my plan was um, if I won to, to nominate a black female justice, but I didn't win. So, um, look, <laughs> like I said, I'm ABT. I'm anyone but Trump. I'm going to enthusiastically vote for Joe Biden. I did vote for Bernie in the Texas primary um, just because I think that that was just a very unique vote to do and he's likely not going to run again and I agree with his policies but um, we need Trump out the office point blank period let's just get back to some normalcy hold Joe to the fire and if we don't like Joe I mean we can <laughs> try to nominate someone else America did you hear that my daughter just admitted that she voted for Bernie Sanders Bernie Sanders <laughs> <laughs> I surely oh, did. <laughs> I surely did. All right. Okay. I mean, it is what it is. You're a grown woman, you know. <laughs> um, you know, but uh, um, that. But I, I, I think it brings an interesting take to our conversations because, look, we are of different generations. We both love the Lord. We yeah. both are on our way to heaven. We both speak in tongues. We. <laughs> All of that. Yeah, all of that. But uh, we, we do see the world slightly, uh, is it slightly, uh, considerably different? Slightly different, maybe? A little bit between slightly and considerable? Mediumly different. <laughs> okay, moderately <laughs> different, right? Yeah, moderately different. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. guess I never told you, you all, I voted for Bernie, huh? No, you didn't. And okay. you didn't have to. I mean, that's your thing. <laughs> I mean, that's completely you. Now, yeah. Chloe, what I've done is I put um, Mr. Floyd's family on the screen. I don't yeah. know all of these people. I think one of them is his brother, uh, probably a sister. But I didn't want to leave without um, putting his family and making this real for us. Um, his family. I saw one sister do a Today Show interview today. 
and she has not seen the video. Can you imagine seeing your loved one? Can you imagine your loved one's death last few moments begging for his life is on a video that is circulating around America uh, and will be all, I mean, that is just, I, I, I can't fathom that. Really. I can't imagine it. Mm -mm. I can't. And then he, to hear him cry out for his mama right before he lays his head down. It's amazing. It passes. And we are, we are, um, uh, we're going to, we have just accepted a case of a man who was racially profiled at a Wells Fargo bank. And we're going to be representing him and we're going to be introducing him to uh, you all. Um, and what you see happen to him, it also brought him to tears. Yeah. A big, big grown, big old black guy brought to tears because of the way he was treated at a Wells Fargo bank. We're gonna do everything we can to get him some justice. Yep. Okay. I'm excited to introduce him to people and tell a story. It needs to be out there. Absolutely. So Chloe, I've enjoyed this conversation. Um, Me I, too. I, I think that we um, help people understand a little bit better why police officers are able to get away with this. They got protections galore from yeah. the U.S. Supreme Court down to the grand juries, down to the regular juries. Um, I remember in the Walter Scott case, they took the case to trial. There was one person on that jury who said, I just cannot bring myself to convict a police officer for shooting a black guy. Mm. And that resulted in a hung jury. They were going to try him again, but he decided to go ahead and plea to um, something that resulted in 20 years. I think it was murder or second degree murder or something. Um, so the juries, all of these built in protections, these police officers know they have, and that's why they continue to do what they're doing. But we gave you some things that we can do to, to, to change this, okay? All right, so that's it. Let me see if there are any other questions. Um, we do encourage you all to uh, go to my Facebook page and find those videos that I of me do, of comparing the Biden, um, the Biden, what is it? Platform. Platform, or what do they call it though? The Biden Black Agenda. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, com where I compared Biden's black agenda and Trump's lack thereof. <laughs> OK, <laughs> uh, yeah. Go to my page and look that up. I think it'll be very informing or you can go to our YouTube page and watch those videos. We have uploaded them to YouTube. Well, Chloe, I enjoyed it. I don't have anything else. What about you? I did as well. Guys, please share this video. Um, share with all your friends. Get it out there. We want as many people to see and be educated and gain knowledge from watching this video. I pray that you all have a blessed rest of your week. And we, we will see you next time on our next episode. Peace. Peace.